All right, I think we're uh, ready to go. Everyone's quieted down at least. So let's open the book of Ezekiel, chapter 35, and handouts are coming around. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 35, and we're going to try, you see on your handout, try to get through 35 and 36. We'll see about that. But uh, I'll repeat again what I've said the last couple weeks, which is that we're taking things a little bit more slowly right now in this portion of our class, and kind of on a little bit of a Sunday-Wednesday um, pattern here, where Sunday we will uh, maybe cover the basics of the text. Um, maybe it will be the case today we'll cover most of the text. Um, and then on Wednesday, we'll have an opportunity to either finish the text or uh, get into some deeper uh, you know, analysis of the text, look at broader themes in Scripture, make application of the text, and, uh, or maybe do both. So that's the plan. If, you, if we go through 35 and 36, I'm not going to impose the same sort of strict regulation I did last Sunday and say you're not allowed to, to say anything that connects to Jesus or to the new covenant or makes an application for us. I'm not going to impose that restriction on you, but I will say that if it feels like today we're kind of just, you know, going through and covering the basics, the surface level maybe of, of just what the text says and what it means, um, know that on Wednesday, we will have an opportunity to dig deeper into these things, look at these themes in other places of Scripture, and make application for ourselves. So, uh, here are the objectives for today. Again, fairly uh, straightforward. You should be able to know where Mount Seir is, if you don't already, and explain why it receives a judgment in chapter 35. Uh, you should be able to identify for whose sake God is going to act. And a part of that is understanding you know, not for whose sake he's going to act, um, but what he says uh, he's going to do and why, and then list some things that God is going to do. So the, the first is kind of the why, the second is the what uh, that God is going to do, as talked about in chapter 36. So let's jump in. Uh, we are in this section on uh, what we've called hope for Israel's future. There's a lot of judgment in the early parts of Ezekiel. They early, first two-thirds almost, okay? Uh, judgment for God's people in Judah and Jerusalem as they are awaiting the destruction by the Babylonians, and then a section of judgment on the surrounding nations. And we've said that in chapter 33, there's a shift to hope. But let's read chapter 35 and see what you think about uh, what chapter 35 is saying and why it's included here. Ezekiel 35, not too long, 15 verses, so we'll just read the whole thing here. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, Set your face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it and say to it, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, Mount Seir. I will stretch out my hand against you. I will make you a desolation and a waste. I will lay waste your cities. You will become a desolation. Then you will know that I am the Lord because you have had everlasting enmity and have delivered the sons of Israel to the power of the sword at the time of their calamity, at the time of the punishment of the end. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord God, I will give you over to bloodshed, and bloodshed will pursue you. Since you have not hated bloodshed, therefore bloodshed will pursue you. I will make Mount Seir a waste and a desolation. I will cut off from it the one who passes through and returns. I will fill its mountains with its slain on your hills and your valleys and your ravines. Those slain will fall by the sword. I will make you an everlasting desolation, and your cities will not be inhabited. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Because you have said, these two nations and these two lands will be mine. We will possess them, although the Lord was there. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord God, I will deal with you according to your anger and according to your envy, which you showed because of your hatred against them. So I will make myself known among them when I judge you. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have heard all your revilings, which you have spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, they are laid desolate. They are given to us for food. And you have spoken arrogantly against me and have multiplied your words against me. I've heard it. Thus says the Lord God, as the earth rejoices, I will make you a desolation. As you rejoiced over the inheritance of the house of Israel because it was desolate, so I will do to you. You will be a desolation, O Mount Seir, and all Edom, all of it. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Okay. Uh, where is Mount Seir? 
near the Dead Sea, between the Gulf of Aqaba, Brian says, there you go, now you have the answer to your question. You're like, oh, now I get it. Right. It's by the Gulf of Aqaba. Uh, sorry, let me rephrase the question. Uh, in what country or kingdom is Mount Seir? Edom, which is right off of the kind of southeast corner of the Dead Sea, as Brian and Jordan pointed out to us. Now, who is Edom? Who, who does Edom come from? Esau. And this is the weird thing. You're like, I thought we talked about this already. You're probably thinking, like, this sounds familiar. And back in chapter 25, when we started that new section that we said was the judgment on the nations— there was a judgment on Edom in chapter 25, verses 12 to 14. But we come back to that here, and a judgment against the mountain, specifically, which I think we would mostly see as a representative of the people of Edom. Why are they being judged? Basically, what would you say about that? They hated Israel. Is it just for that? Take advantage of their distress and punishment. Notice the language of the text talks about delivering them over to the sword. Um, it talks about how they, they didn't hate bloodshed, uh, but it says they delivered the sons of Israel over to the sword. There's a whole book of the Bible. Uh, I've already showed you, so I can't ask you the trivia question. A whole book of the Bible devoted to the judgment of Edom, and that's Obadiah. As my mom used to say, Oh, bad Edom. That's how you remember. Obadiah, Oh, bad Edom. Why don't you just, I mean, Obadiah, it's one chapter. It's, that's how long the book is. So let me work through here. Okay, there's Obadiah. Before Jonah, after Amos. Uh, but notice some verses in the book of Obadiah because, uh, and what we're going to read is not terribly specific, but, but you read Ezekiel 35 and it says they delivered the sons of Israel over or they you know, rejoiced in their calamity. And you think, well, what's going on here? Uh, what exactly did they do to Israel? And we get a little bit more specific in the book of Obadiah, um, which, depending on the timing, could be describing the exact same thing that um, Edom is receiving judgment for in Ezekiel 35. Obadiah 10, uh, because of violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame. You will be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. You see the picture. You see the Babylonians coming into the city to, you know, plunder. And the Edomites are kind of just, you know, walking in with the crowd, you know. It seems like a good opportunity to uh, take some stuff for ourselves, right? Verse 12, do not gloat over your brother's day. Literally your brother, right? Esau and Jacob. The day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast in the day of their distress. Verse 13, do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. Yes, you do not gloat over their calamity in the day of their disaster. Do not loot their wealth in the day of their disaster. Do not stand at the fork of the road, verse 14, to cut down their fugitives. And do not imprison their survivors in the day of their distress. That's another level. So we have the rejoicing. They were celebrating when, when Israel fell, when Judah fell. They were kind of helping themselves to the plunder of Judah and Jerusalem. But Obadiah says they're even on the road. And when there's refugees from Judah and Jerusalem, they're attacking them. They're cutting them down or they're imprisoning them back home. So Obadiah is helpful for seeing some of the uh, maybe again, more specific elements of what Edom was responsible for. Uh, look down at verse 2. Go back to uh, Ezekiel 35 here, uh, where our text is this morning. Uh, Ezekiel 35, verse 10, um, it's, first of all, it says in verse 10, because these two nations and these two lands, what are the two nations and two lands, do you think, from Edom's perspective? Probably no, northern and southern kingdoms, Israel and Judah. And what are they saying is going to happen to those lands? We'll take them. We will possess the land of Israel. Okay. Um, Maybe you've seen pictures or you're familiar or maybe you just understand that the, the name Dead Sea is, does not paint a picture of fertility and, uh, you know, natural beauty and resources. Okay, so you can kind of understand the environment that the Edomites lived in. Very rocky, 
uh, you know, literally lived in the cliffs uh, of the rock in large part. And so, you know, they're sitting there and the land of Israel and Judah, which is definitely a nicer land, now it's uninhabited. Now the people have been taken away. Seems like a prime, prime for the taking to step in and take their land. But in verse 13, God says that this arrogance of Edom, so we're talking about their, their kind of view and their actions towards Israel and Judah. He says it's against me, verse 13. As you've spoken arrogantly against me and I have multiplied your, and have multiplied your words against me, I have heard it. What do you think is going on here? Why do you think that God tell, says that the Edomites have been arrogant towards him, spoken arrogantly towards him? What do you think? What do you think, Brian? Well, I, I can only speculate because he doesn't say, but it, it seems that since Edom opposed God's children in Israel, and in addition, did not recognize him as God uh, and say they're going to take possession of the Israelites' inheritance, which is reserved for the children of Israel, according to God, that, that shows their arrogance that they could oppose God and what he has ordained for the Hebrew nation. Okay. I don't know. Thank you, Brian. There's a possibility there. Uh, let's get Robert for maybe another thought. But Brian says that God had... You know, allotted the land for the Israelites. That was his purpose and promise. And so, you know, to take it for themselves would be to oppose God's purposes. Robert, what do you think? Yeah, may, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it feels maybe a little speculation. It feels a whole lot like kind of Cain and Abel, uh, that because of that special relationship that they had as brothers uh, with now uh, Esau and Jacob, that they should have done more to be on God's side, to be supportive of their relatives. Um, so they're treated, at, they're treated differently and called out for uh, not being like, or, or for being like the other nations around them. So maybe an idea we've seen before, thank you, Robert, about uh, the escalation of their crimes because of the special nature of their relationship with Israel. It makes it worse that they were so close to Israel in the beginning and have turned against. And by the way, this is something we maybe forget. What was the relationship, what happened with the relationship between Jacob and Esau in the book of Genesis? Yeah, they were, they were but, well, I don't know, depends on how you read it. Uh, some people will say they're buds, but they do reconcile. They do, I mean, there is obviously hostility, I want to kill you, I want to get away from you at the very beginning, and then later on there is a reconciliation. So it's not like they ended as enemies, necessarily. Okay, they come together, they bury their father. Um, but yet, as Robert's pointing out, the relationship between these two was, was always very hostile. Almost to the point where, as we'll see this in, maybe in chapter 36, Edom is like representative of the enemies of God's people. That's like, if you want to think of a name for the enemies of God's people, it's Edom, right? Something like that. Albert, what do you think? Based on their origin or, or how they came about, this wasn't a foreign land with foreign gods. They, they had knowledge of God, and they would have known how the land would have come about. They would have been aware of prophecy and all, so their arrogance was... We're, not, we're going to overtake this nation and take their land. It was, they, they knew where its, its origins were, and so they were showing arrogance towards God. And, and you know, it's hard to know the specifics, that you, Albert, um, but uh, I think it is true that if any nation around knew the stories of the patriarchs, then the Edomites surely, you know, uh, how much they knew, we don't know. But, you know, if anybody did, they likely did. There's even some evidence that uh, some of the characters that show up in the book of Job uh, would have connection to Esau's line. Um, and so uh, that might support that as well. Okay, Brian, last word, then we're going to move on here too. I, I think also uh, that God was offended that um, Edom, along with Ammon and Moab, had forgotten that God had delivered them when the, Joshua was leading the people to the promised land. And they were spared because they are the brothers of the Jews. And, uh, and now they're, in a, in a sense, attacking their brothers. Thank you, Brian. So, uh, turning against God's own kindness, maybe even, as well. Okay. So I had another question here. You know, okay, I thought we said we were done with judgment. We keep seeing judgment in this section on hope. You know, you're like, this outline is breaking down further and further each week, you know. Uh, so we might ask, well, why is the judgment against Edom? I thought we already did it for one. I thought this was a section on hope for two. 
So what's going on here? I actually want to uh, wait on that answer, that discussing that question, and read the next few verses, because uh, all this, I think, goes together, into chapter 36. Um, so uh, keep that question maybe in the back of your minds. Uh, why a judgment against Mount Seir in 35 as God turns his attention to some other mountains? Chapter 36, verse 1, And you, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel. And say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because the enemy has spoken against you, aha, uh, the everlasting heights have become our possession. Therefore prophesy and say, thus says the Lord God, for good reason they have made you desolate and crushed you from every side, that you would become a possession to the rest of the nations. You have been taken up in the talk and the whispering of the people. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the words of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains and to the hills, to the ravines and to the valleys, to the desolate wastes and the forsaken cities, which have become a prey and a derision to the rest of the nations which are round about. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, surely in the fire of my jealousy, I have spoken against the rest of the nations and against all Edom, who appropriated my land for themselves as a possession with wholehearted joy, with scorn of soul to drive it out for a prey. Therefore prophesy against the land of Israel and say to the mountains and to the hills and the ravines and the valleys. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and in my wrath because you have endured the insults of the nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I have sworn that surely the nations which are around you will themselves endure their insults. Verse 8, but you, O mountains of Israel, you will put forth your branches and bear your fruit for my people Israel, for they will soon come. Behold, I am for you. I will turn to you. You will be cultivated and sown. I will multiply men on you, all the house of Israel, all of it. And the cities will be inhabited. The waste places will be rebuilt. I will multiply on you man and beast, and they will increase and be fruitful. I will cause you to be inhabited as you were formerly, and you will, tr- and will treat you better than at first. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. Yes, I will cause men, my people Israel, to walk on you and possess you so that you will become their inheritance, and never again bereave them of children. Verse 13, thus says the Lord God, because they say to you, you are a devourer of men, and have bereaved your nation of children. Therefore, you will no longer devour men, and no longer bereave your nation of children, declares the Lord God. I will let you hear insults. I will not let you hear insults from the nations anymore, nor will you bear disgrace from the peoples any longer, nor will you cause your nation to stumble any longer, declares the Lord God. God. Okay, so having read that, how would you answer this question here uh, that we just asked? Why does God offer this judgment on Mount Seir, on the mountain of Edom, uh, in this section, which is a section on hope? Brian, you had your hand up earlier. Now you're getting your chance. Sorry to make you wait. I was just going to say, yeah, from what I had written down, it's hope because if Israel was to return to the land God promised, the bully's going to be gone. I'm taking care of the. I'm taking care of a thorn in your side, and these people aren't going to be there to harass you like they were before. Kind of laying the groundwork to help them establish their nation. Thank you, Brian. Uh, hope, he says, because the bully's going to be gone. Great image, and the thorn in their side is going to be gone. Another great image. Other thoughts on why. The judgment on Edom is included in the hope section. Ian? I mean, mean it simply is just highlighting that everyone is subject to God's judgment at some point and that God isn't solely punishing Israel for their iniquities, their sin, their pride, all all of the sins they've committed, that everyone's going to be affected by this. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Again, that universality of God's work in the world and his sovereignty um, th- this I think we've talked about this, we talk about this a lot, maybe, um, or at least I think about it a lot because it's everywhere, and it's one of those things that's maybe a little bit obvious, but it really is I think important to make the distinction. Um, for instance, when God brings His people through the Red Sea in Exodus chapter fourteen, remember they sing a song in Exodus fifteen, celebrating the fact that they came through the Red Sea. In that song, what's one of the main things that they sing about and rejoice about? Is a song like, you know, we came through the Red Sea, we're alive, we're safe, you know. 
What's, what's the other kind of major theme in their celebration? Well, yeah, the might of God. Yeah, that's maybe the main theme. Okay. So, what is Albert? God heard them. Remember what they say? Pharaoh, what do you say, Rick? Have have been cast into the sea. There is just great celebration over the fall of God's enemies. And the Red Sea story is kind of the quintessential story of God's salvation in the Old Testament. So you see it clearly in that story, and it happens over and over and over again. God can't save his people without dealing with the enemies. That goes hand in hand. The Red Sea like, doesn't make any sense if it's only the salvation of, of, you know, I mean, I guess it would have been cool if they came upon the Red Sea, it parted, they went through, and then the waters closed again. It's like, well, that's cool, but it's only the Red Sea story because God's enemies were destroyed and the horse and his rider were cast into the sea. And so I think that's, uh, you know, I would, uh, Brian po- pointed out that, that kind of thing. Um, but my point, I guess, is that it's, it's, it's a necessity. It's a necessity for God's enemies to be destroyed, for God's people to be saved. Okay? And you see that uh, fitting in here in chapter 36 as well. By the way, this is not the first time that the mountains, the geographical features, maybe that's something we can explore more on Wednesday. Uh, why talk to the land? Uh, well, God has done this before. Back in chapter 6, he addressed a judgment against the mountains of Israel for their idolatry. And in some ways, he revisits that in this chapter, and he says, you have been made desolate. But what does he say in the first three verses about the fact that the mountains have been you know, destroyed, made desolate? What does he say about that? What does God say about that desolation that came on the mountains? Why it happened? How he feels about it? And what what were those altars about, Shannon? It's idol worship. So God says in uh, verse 3 there, uh, how does he feel about having destroyed the altars and the idolaters' worship and all that? Is he sad about that? Start regretting? Oh, yeah, I was a little hard on you. What did he say? For good reason. Yeah, yeah, to show, to, uh, you see how many times in this chapter, we, we should not stop, you know, highlighting it because it happens or said so much in Ezekiel, uh, to know that he is the Lord. For good reason, he says, I did all these things to you. Uh, but specifically, he talks about this idea, and this comes up over and over again in the chapter, this idea of reproach or disgrace or derision or insult. Um, let's maybe talk about that for just a second because it is repeated so much. What does it mean to suffer reproach? Or again, you know, think about these other words that are similar that are being used. Insult, derision, disgrace. What, what, is, uh, what is all that referring to? And maybe you could think about the story of Israel. Uh, they're the ones being addressed here. In what way do they suffer reproach? What does that mean? Derision, insult, disgrace. So the result is that it provides humility. But what does that actually mean? Like, well, what's... How hard time articulating the question. What does it mean to suffer reproach? Shame? From who? Where's that shame coming from? Other nations. Okay. How would other nations shame Israel? You got the microphone, Michael. And take them over or laugh at them when they get taken over? Oh. Yeah, so again, as we've seen with the judgment of the nations, I don't think it's simply, it's not just the physical act of conquering or looting or whatever. There is another layer on top of this. What do we say? You add insult to injury, okay? You see that's a major theme going on here. It's not just, yeah, you were, you know, you were hurt. You had your stuff taken. You were removed from your land. It's you were laughed at. You were a laughing stock. You were the, 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 you know, the law would say you're going to become a byword among the nations. People are going to pass by Jerusalem and say, look at those guys. Okay? They were taken from their land and their city was completely destroyed. Okay? 
Um, that's, that's what's being talked about here. You're being disgraced, you're suffering derision, you're suffering reproach. Um, we should not overlook that or minimize that. Uh, that. That's a horrible thing to have to experience, especially, again, on top of the physical consequences that they had suffered. Okay, what are you going to say, Albert? It's mockery and made fun of on the definition of derision, but a victim of bullying in, in today's terms as we see it. Sure, and, and Brian mentioned that, that same word earlier. So thank you, Albert, for bringing that back to our attention. Um, and that, I think that's a great example because with bullying, we understand it's far more, you know, than, I mean, you, you, could, you could suffer the same physical injury from a buddy who's, you know, you're playing with, or, you know, you have that kind of back and forth banter with. Um, but when a bully does it to you, or something, they don't even have to hurt you physically. Because it's not about the physical pain, it's about the shame, it's about the insult, the derision, and all that stuff. That's what Israel had faced. And so, what is God going to do? He's going to take care of the bully, to use Brian's uh, word again. Okay? Um, Edom is named, but again, they're not the only ones. You go back to that list of nations in chapter 25. But Edom does seem to stand as representative of the nations, the bullies that God will take care of. And that is good news for God's people, that his enemy, that God's enemies and the people, enemies of God's people will be destroyed. But then he goes on in verses 8 to 12 to bless them again. Um, and it's a beautiful description, I think, of the blessing of God. Again, you're, he's talking to mountains. And so the message is there's going to be people on you again. There's going to be cities built on you again. There's going to be growth. There's going to be life. There's going to be possession Okay, you no longer be desolate. And uh, the final section, then 13 to 15, comes back to that idea of uh, you will not suffer shame anymore. I'll just point this out, uh, 13 to 15. Again, you have to think in the terms of the metaphor. So uh, he's talking to mountains. Yeah, the, ultimately, this is about the people of God, but he's talking to the mountains. And so he says in, in verses 13 to 15, you're, you, mountains, are not going to bereave the nation of children. You will not devour men. So what's going on here? God's saying, you know, the mountains were like, you know, eating people, you know, swallowing people alive. Well, in a sense, they were. Because what was being done on the mountains of Israel was, as we already read in Ezekiel, violence and bloodshed. What happens to the blood that's shed on the mountains of Israel? Where does it go? What happens to the bodies that are shed on the mountains of Israel? Where do they go? They go into the ground, okay? The mountains are devouring them, okay? And there's a sense in which for the mountains themselves, that, that's a painful thing, okay? Uh, they, have, they have been disgraced because they have been, you know, covered in the bodies of the slain among the people of God, and they're having to dis- devour, um, you know, the children, literally, remember, child sacrifice of the people of God. That's been a disgrace for the mountain, for the land of God and his people, so God's going to reverse that. They will no longer suffer that kind of disgrace when they are re-inhabited uh, with this kind of restored people. Okay? All right. That's all maybe a little bit weird, but uh, Robert, is something more weird or bring us back to in touch with the reality here? Just, just uh, in... Exactly what's going on in, in that area. Um, that actually talks about all the other nations, as well as the Israelites, as well as the um, uh, those in Jerusalem and, and Judah as well. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but but that would really just reinforce your point about exactly how the the ground is impacted by it. Uh, and it, you know, it also reminds me of the the idea of the uh, the jubilee year. Is that the fiftieth year where the land needs to rest and is uh, everything is restored back to kind of resetting? To me, this is the big reset. And um, you can find it. I'll find it. I'll take that as my assignment for Wednesday when we dig a little bit deeper. Somewhere, I know that's really convincing, somewhere in the Bible it says that uh, the 70 years of captivity was 70 years because it was one year for every Sabbath year. Remember, every seventh year was supposed to be let the land rest. It was one year for every Sabbath year that the people did not honor or recognize. They never gave the land a break, so God was going to give the land a break for 70 years 
Um, and uh, I think all that fits in with, with what we're saying. And thank you, Robert. That passage in 2 Kings 17 uh, is great for understanding this is what's happening in Israel and um, how God feels about it, how the land feels about it. Even. Okay, so let's keep going here uh, to the, the big part of this chapter that we uh, want to get to. And I'm sure we'll spend more time with on Wednesday. But pick up in Ezekiel 36, beginning in verse 16, we'll read to the rest of the chapter. It says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel was living in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and by their deeds. They were before me, sorry, uh, they, their way before me was like the uncleanness of a woman in her impurity. Therefore I poured out my wrath on them for the blood which they had shed on the land, because they had defiled it with their idols. Also, I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed throughout the lands. According to their ways and their deeds, I judged them. When they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name, because it was said of them, These are the people of the Lord, of Yahweh. Yet they have come out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations where they went. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which you have profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, so you will be my people, and I will be your God. Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the grain and multiply it, And I will not bring famine on you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field so that you will not receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations. And you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. You will loathe yourselves in your sight for your iniquities and your abominations. I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places to be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of being a desolation in the sight of everyone who passes by. They will say the desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden and the waste desolate and ruined cities fortified are inhabited. Then the nations that are left round about you will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted that which was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. Thus says the Lord God, this also, I will let, uh, this also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them. I will increase their men like a flock, like the flock for sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem during her appointed feast. So will the waste places be filled with flocks of men. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Okay, um, I ask you this question, this is on the back side of your handout. Um, looking at verses 16 to 21, this first section here. Um, there's a rela- kind of a triangular relationship here between the people, that is the house of Israel, the land, and the holy name of Yahweh. You may want to try to explain that triangular relationship, the people, the land, and God's name. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, um, I mean, all this just seems to, to be throwing all the way back into the, you know, earlier Old Testament, you know, when... You know, and in fact, I was kind of reading through this, thinking about it, until he actually said it in uh, in verse 28, uh, when he kept saying, uh, you know, so you will be my people and I will be your God, uh, that there was that, that relationship that God was always trying to build, and, you know, they were his people, and he brought them into the land. The land was a gift to them, um, you know, for, for being his people, for being his chosen people, um, you know, that they, that they kept turning him away. And, and it, I mean, really at one point, I mean, he, he finally decides, I'm going to take this land away from you um, because you're defiling it and you're not respecting the gift and you're not being my people. So if you don't want to be my people, let's let you go. And he says he's going to bring them back. But, but you know, it's that 
that kind of thing, you know, where, where you say, you know, this is what you want. I'm going to give you what you asked for. Thank you, Mike. And uh, Jordan, I think, has uh, just to kind of reiterate. So Mike says, first of all, see all three of them here, God gave the people the land as part of that covenant relationship. Okay? The people defiled the land as they broke away from God and their rebellion against him. Jordan, more to say about that? Maybe not to be too simplistic, but they're all correlated, it seems. So the people defile it by their deeds, which thus in turn profanes the name of God. And so one, one of these things is all correlated with the other ones. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Jordan. And uh, that I think Mike and Jordan have basically laid all this out. Uh, in fact, Mike even went, again, a step further back to say that the land was a gift from God to his covenant people. The people defile the land with evil, and so God removed them from the land. I think similar to what we said earlier, okay, and it's, you know, uh, gives the land a break, for, among other things. And, but the fact that he removed them from the land does what? What do the nations say when they see God's people leaving the land and going off into captivity? That's the people of Yahweh. Maybe Yahweh can't protect his people. Maybe he can't take care of his people. We've said this before, and um, again, these are kind of themes we could explore more on Wednesday. But especially in the ancient world, remember there was a connection between the God of a people and uh, the land, right? So it's like the people around would have thought of the land as being, well, that's Yahweh's land, Yahweh's people. The people get taken into captivity, well, then that reflects poorly on Yahweh, he can't protect his people. So his name becomes profane, becomes insulted, becomes despised among the nations because the people were removed from the land. Okay? So all these things here fit together. And so God is going to act. Why not is God going to act? I don't know, can't think of a smooth way to phrase that. But why, cause it's not, why is he not going to act? Because he is going to act. But he, he's going to act, but for what not reason? Not for you. This is tough. I, I want to hear what you have to think about this. Not for your sake. So Brian says it, it's to say you didn't earn it. Okay, it's really this is said twice. It's said once at the beginning of all of this, uh, verse twenty-two. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel. I'm about to act, but for my holy name. And then he repeats it again um, in verse thirty-two. I'm not doing this for your sake. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded, O house of Israel. Anything more you want to say about that or ask about that? Why does God say I'm not doing it for you? Doing it for my name. John, what do you think? Well, even going back to the promises, it was for one reason, so that all nations should be blessed. And all throughout De Deuteronomy, you read that the purpose for the law is so that the people can live in such a way that they are um, they're elevated, but not for themselves, but so that other nations will come to know God. They were meant to be a beacon. Uh, you know, to live pure and holy would bring sh glory, but not their glory. And uh, I think that's what you see here is he's not going to let his name fall because of them. And so the restitution is not about them. It's about him. And thank you, John. John's pointing out it's always been about him from the beginning, from the initial promise and the plan of redemption. Um, really, the, message of the, old, or the story of the Old Testament is God accomplishing his promises in spite of the people. Not uh, because, you know, they have, you know, done something. I, mean, I think we would, we would do well to take something for ourselves from that as well. It's not about us. It's ultimately about God. Um, full stop. Um, okay, Brian, quickly, and then we would do want to move on to the, what God's going to do. I think this harkens back to the constant refrain, then you will know that I right. am God. Yep, yep. And again, it's, it, it's, it's said so much, we're like not mentioning it because it's coming up so much. It's just like, you know. Uh, the mile markers on the road, you don't pay attention to those. Okay? But in Ezekiel, it's every other paragraph. Then they will know that I am the Lord. So thank you for that reminder, Brian. Um, okay, that's why God's God doesn't act for the sake of his name, not for them. What's he going to do? You just, let's just rapid fire some of these out. Uh, what's he going to do? This is amazing stuff. Okay, they're going to put him back in the land. They're going to come back. Heard another. Was that Anita's voice I heard? Yeah, he's going to uh, take them out of the nations, remove that, that threat. As I said before, they're going to come back into the land. What else? They're going to be cleansed. Why do they need to be cleansed? Because they've defiled themselves and they've defiled the land. Okay, they're going to be cleansed of that filth. Okay, 
Uh, I don't know if there's really, I don't want to say there's a progression here like stages, but there, there's some sort of, you know, interrelationship between these things, I, I think, as at least these first few. So they're going to come back, they're going to be cleansed, but being cleansed is not the full story because what does God really want? Yeah, so one way you can think of it is, well, God wants them to be obedient, but the only way they can be obedient is how? Well, with new hearts and new spirits. I do think in 26 and 27, by the way, with the hard thing, or even, uh, you know, this contrast between stone and flesh, remember that was God's indictment of the people from the very beginning. When he called Ezekiel, he said that he was going to make, this is, you know, the head, not the heart, but I think there's an ob- obvious connection. Remember God told Ezekiel in his call in chapter 3, Ezekiel, I'm going to make your head really hard. He's the hard-headed prophet. Now, why did Ezekiel's head need to be so hard? Yeah, specifically, the people were hard-headed. He had to be more hard-headed than the people, and that was really hard-headed. This idea of hardness, the hardness of stone, remember he said, I'm going to make you like diamond, right, against their flint or whatever, you know, what it was. Um, the, the, we, the people, have hearts of stone, but they need a new heart. They need a soft heart, a heart of flesh. And then with the Spirit, I do think there's a correlation. They need a new Spirit, verse 26. So what could be better than the Spirit of God himself? being given to his people in verse 27, okay? Um, then there's some other things here. Uh, notice, though, in, in 27, we, we didn't put it up there, but there is that one more step. The new heart and the new spirit is what enables them, empowers them to keep the commandments, okay? To do, uh, to observe the ordinances in verse 27. Then there will just be this restoration of relationship. The phrase has already been highlighted. I will be uh, their God. You will be my people, that goes back all the way, almost to Genesis. In Genesis, there's like a version of that said to Abraham. But really, the first time in full is in Exodus. But it gets repeated all throughout the law and the prophets. This is what God always wanted. This is what God is making happen, uh, is going to make happen for his people. There will be this restoration of relationship, and there will be prosperity, as he describes it, in the land. Okay. Um, Albert, idea on that? Something that I'm just struck me is, you know, we keep using the word appropriately, punishment, but God's disciplining them, and you see in this, I'm going to give you a new heart. It's, it's not like he's going to reboot, but what he has done to them, and then what he's about to provide is going to give them a new heart. So it reminds me of God's purpose of discipline, and how much we bear, and how much we can take, and how grateful I should be that God's in control, and not man in regards to my discipline to restore me. Thank you, Albert. And it doesn't say anywhere in this passage, new covenant, but jot down in your margin, this is Ezekiel's version in many ways of the Jeremiah 31 passage. In Jeremiah 31, he does say, I'm going to make a new covenant because the old covenant, they broke. But the way Jeremiah describes the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, has a lot of overlap and connection in the wording even to what Ezekiel's saying in Ezekiel 36. As as Albert said, God is, is doing something new. Uh, new heart, new spirit, his spirit, and their, this relationship will be restored. Okay, this is a conversation maybe we can have on Wednesday. It's the tough one. This sounds so beautiful and so nice. You need to read this passage, t- definitely stop. You know, if you're reading this passage publicly for people to feel good, uh, stop before you get to 31, because then he says, you'll remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. You will loathe yourselves. Uh, in your own sight for the iniquities and abominations. And again, he says, I'm not doing it for your sake. Be ashamed and confound it. So maybe one of the things we can do on Wednesday is talk about, which we've talked some about before in this class, but why all this talk in the new covenant and the, you know, the reset and the new spirit, new heart, why all the talk about our former ways and loathing ourselves because of the sins that we've committed. Uh, so we can talk about that. And then a couple of things we, we round out here uh, before the bell. The bell hasn't rung yet, right? There you go. Um, This is a little bit of a preview maybe for Wednesday as well. Notice the description of what God's going to do is a, it's two things. It's a city that's rebuilt and it's a garden. It's like the Garden of Eden. It's a garden and a city. Um, And then uh, it's inhabited by, maybe back to our imagery of the shepherd, flocks, flocks of men. Um, So read back through 35 and 36 for Wednesday and like we've done, you know, try to see where all the connections might be to other passages and themes of the Bible. Thank you, guys.